you hear me? All right, my name is Pauline Russell and I am WCN staff. I just wanted to give you all a quick reminder that if you stay until five, parking is on us. If you leave beforehand, you have to pay. <laughs> so I uh, just wanted to let everyone know that. And please join me in welcoming to the stage Rocio Palacios of the Andean Cat Alliance. Thanks, Pauline. Um, I'm invited here to introduce one of my favorite conservation heroes. This guy was with us when we captured the first Andean cat with our team in Bolivia a long time ago. And he saw something. You know, he roams the planet looking for rare cats and he finds passionate people that work with them. He empowers those teams into, you know, to be bigger organizations so those organizations can thrive. Without him, the Andean Cat Alliance wouldn't exist. It's my great pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Jim Sanderson. Thank you all for being here. Well, I know I stand up here before you, but I'm a lot like you. I was raised with cats and dogs as a kid, and I had this blind cat that used to ride around on my shoulder. And I know it's an East Coast thing to say, but uh, I would take her out in the backyard and watch her roam around and navigate her environment uh, blind while the other kids were playing stickball. And um, I watched her day after day. Sometimes she would just sleep. I learned a lot from her. I might have been her eyes, but she was my everything else. She's never far behind. And I want to tell you about some of the small cats that we're working on now. Okay, see, this is a tigrina. Well, here are some of the cats we work on. And I know all of you think that we actually get to handle all the cats. That's not so. Um, here's what we do. We work with our colleagues all around the world to address the conservation issues associated with these small cats and their disappearing habitats. Here are some of my colleagues, Ashan Tadugula, who was here two years ago, near a street sign that now we're seeing people take selfies of. Uh, warning uh, motors of fishing cats. My colleague Anya Barshkova in Russia working on Manul. And here's my colleague Constanza Napolitano in Chile with Awinia, the cat that I studied for my PhD. We actually have three approaches. First, we work with the species where we can. We work with their habitats, so that's the wildlands. And we work with something we call guardians which are the people in country working every day to address the threats that these cats face. I work only with in-country partners around the world who live in their home country and want to work on these small cats. So that's, that's the basis of what I do. I don't like to go there and tell them what to do. I help them to do what they do. Well, here I am with three of those cats. But very rarely do we get to actually handle the cats. Here's a flat-headed cat from Thailand and a weenia and the Andean cat that we captured in Bolivia. With wild lands, well, here's a place that illustrates what I'm talking about. This is in the, on the Panama-Costa Rica border. And there are six species of wild cats that live here in Le Amistad uh, International Park. Now, the, the parks there are not what we think of as national parks. There are no headquarters. There's uh, no real guard staff. And, and we, we have to beef up those areas to protect these cats and other species that live there. It turns out that there's no other place like this north of the equator in the Americas that has so many species of cats. So this is one of those places around the world that's a cat hotspot that we want to protect. And there are several others around the world that, that are 
have high concentrations of cats that we want to protect. Here's some of our guardians that I spoke about. Remember species, wild lands, and guardians. Here are, here are um, some of the guardians that we have. And there's Anu Ratniyaku, who I'll introduce later. We had the first international small cat summit just a few weeks ago in the UK where we brought 20 people working on small cats from around the world to actually meet each other for the first time. Now, what, what you have to realize is that the small cats don't have uh, a lot of people working on them. Many people are one ofs. So in the country where they're working, they're the only one that's working on that species. Their colleagues are often far away. They've never met them. They only correspond with them on email. And so this is our first mer meeting where we got together, where we could all meet each other. Uh, we had to uh, bring our sleeping bags because we couldn't afford the linen service. And we had to double up in, in pods uh, every night. We form species working groups. So here's an example of the Manul working group. Uh, my colleagues from uh, Russia uh, to Uzbekistan, Mongolia, working together to save Manul across its range. Here's Ashan working with fishing cats in uh, Sri Lanka, and there's our sign. We actually have our own rehab center. Our problem there is that we have road strikes that kill and injure fishing cats. The injured ones we can help, but we needed a place to put them. There's no such place. We had to build our own. So this is our rehab center, and you can see two happy fishing cats there sitting at the top of the waterfall. Both were males. We were told by my colleague that we shouldn't put two males in the same cage, but we had done that before we, uh, without knowing uh, that they would get along fine. He suggested we should build two nest boxes, one for each male, and you can guess what happened. They both ended up in the same nest box. <laughs> so we learned something about these cats every day. Here's Alvaro um, working on the pompous cat in, in Peru. He's the only one in the world working on pompous cats. It occurs in, in, uh, in Chile, uh, Bolivia, Argentina, Peru, Brazil, but he's the only one working on it in, in, uh, in a, anywhere. He works in Peru. Here's my colleague, Anya Barshkova. We're setting some camera traps in Kazakhstan. And here we're just trying to find out, well, are there any in this particular area in Kazakhstan because nobody's looked. So she's doing the first studies anywhere in these places where we, are, we have big holes in our knowledge that we don't know if the cat exists at all or not. This is typical uh, habitat that we visited together and set camera traps on the Russia-Mongolian uh, uh, border. So this would be prime habitat for Manul. It doesn't look like there are any threats, right? But what you don't see is the, is the herds of goats that people are raising and the, the, um, how the habitat is changing due to grazing. This is the kind of field condition she works in. Uh, the picture on the right is 40 below zero. This is at a temperature when alcohol freezes and the Manul is out there walking around, and so is Anya. She said that, well, she lives in Siberia. She was raised in Siberia. And she said, we're not the ones with the thickest blood. We're the ones with the warmest clothes. <laughs> and I, I was there. I, I believe it. When I'm visiting these places, we often do interviews. It turns out that uh, the further I travel, the more important I become. So I'm being asked, I'm being asked questions in Russian. I talk to my colleague Masha there, we talk about the weather, we talk about something, and then she answers the question in Russian knowing how, how to answer the question. I don't answer the question, she answers the question. But the way we get that interview is, I show up. Okay. And we do that all over the world. So we use my visits to the best advantage. Often these young people can't get in to see government Government, important government people that we have to talk to. But if I travel that far, the door is open, and then my colleagues, my young colleagues, can say what they have to say. 
So I open the door, but they do the talking. Here's Murti Kantamahanti. He's working on fishing cats in, in India. And again, we reduce the threats. What's the threat and what do we have to do to get rid of it? Okay. Here Murti is uh, lecturing a group, um, preaching the gospel on fishing cats, educating, increasing awareness. Murti was able to stop an illegal road through a sanctuary uh, by organizing a bunch of conservation groups and then uh, forcing the court to uh, order the road stopped. That's what we do. What's the threat, the road going through a sanctuary, how do we stop it in the courts? Tiasa Adhaya, well, she's the only person I know that received an award from the Prime Minister of India. He shook her hand for her conservation work. An amazing achievement when, can, when you consider the, that the population in India is over a billion people, that she would receive, I, I have never received a handshake from a president, and I don't know many people that have, but she did. And it's all because of her conservation work on behalf of fishing cats in West Bengal. All the time, left and right, raising awareness, in the newspaper, on TV, that's what she does. She's, and she's terrific at it. But again, they're one ofs. It's not an organization, it's a person. My task is to find that person and enable them. And that's what my donors help me do. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Anya Ratnayaka, working on fishing cats in Sri Lanka, and I know you're gonna find her story fascinating. I'll turn it over to my colleague. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I assure you it's not that cold in Sri Lanka. I was in Nepal. That's why I'm wearing that jumper. <laughs> um, okay, so today I'm going to talk, tell you all the story about Colombo's friendly backyard beast, as I like to call them. For those of you who have never had the pleasure of meeting a fishing cat, I brought Oya along with me. Um, as you can see, fishing cats look very much like lepers, but they have one very unique feature. <laughs> they quack like ducks. So, yeah, so my lovely muscular animal quacks like a duck. Um, so. The fishing cat is a vulnerable species globally, but locally they are still an endangered um, species. They are heavily associated with water-rich habitats, and as their name suggests, they are very, very good at catching fish. Now, I work in um, Colombo, Sri Lanka, and for those of you who don't know where that is, um, it is, where is my laser point? Right there. It's the capital city of the country, and like all capital cities, or most capital cities around the world, it's extremely congested due to um, heavy urbanization. The city itself has an area of around 37 um, square kilometers, but it has a very unique feature, and that is its urban wetlands. Now, the urban wetlands themselves cover about 15% of the city. Um, and they are also home to 277 species of fauna and 252 species of flora, most of which are threatened or endemic. Um, so the civil war in Sri Lanka ended in 2009, um, and with it came a heavy wave of um, urbanization and city beautification. Um, so the government started clearing wetlands. Wetlands at the time were poorly understood habitats, and they obviously were the, on the top of the list of things that needed to go. So this is an example of a wetland that we had. It's uh, called the Bellang Villa Actidia Sanctuary. This photograph is taken in 2012, and this is what it looks like now. So as you can see, there's a very large open body of water which was created for flood control purposes, and there's a lovely little jogging path around it for the residents in the area to do their morning exercise and yoga and whatnot. 
So in 2012, I ended up, um, I graduated and I came back home. And like most young Sri Lankans, I wanted to work with the leopard. But I heard about these wetlands, and I knew that there were fishing cats in these wetlands. And I wanted to know how this wetland habitat specialist was handling all the wetland destruction. So this is that uh, wetland I showed you previously from ground level. Um, so my team and I, and our trusty off-road blue trishaw, uh, went around um, Colombo selecting certain wetlands, and we started setting up camera traps. It took us a couple of months to iron out the kinks because, I mean, we were s starting brand new. We didn't know what we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so it took us a couple of months to get used to everything, um, and then we started getting our cats. This particular cat's name is Ryujin, and he was notorious for, um, for the lack of a better word, pooping in front of our cameras. <laughs> um, <laughs> And um, after he pooped, he would often smell his creations. He was very proud of them. Um, <laughs> and of course, I enjoyed it because to me, finding poop in the field is one of the most exciting things in the world. So I've got, like, I've got poop in my fridge, don't tell my parents or my husband. Um, it's nicely hidden behind uh, <laughs> things in the fridge. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is Ghost. Um, he took us eight months to get this cat on camera. Um, so I was very excited when I finally got him. So once, we've got our once we had our cats on camera, we moved on to capturing them. As you can see, very happy cat. And um, we tranquilized them and we collared them. Um, so we cover their faces so that they don't get stressed out. Um, so next we did, what we did was we released our cats and we tracked them for six months. This cat's name is Vadua. He was a big old male, lots of battle scars on his face, um, torn ears. I don't know if you all can see that, but he's got a nice rip up there. Um, and we tracked, uh, so he was released in the Sri Jayavadanapura wetland sanctuary. And this is a high security zone um, wetland because the parliament is right there. So there's a lot of security around. This is his movement for six months. Um, he used the wetlands very well. Um, he also moved along the borders of these wetlands. Um, so it was very interesting mo uh, movement data. We had never had this data before, so it was quite unique. And so the next cat, I know I'm not supposed to have favorites. It's like all parents. They always say that they don't have a favorite child, but from experience, I know that they do have a favorite child, and that's my younger brother. Um, <laughs> um, so my favorite child is this cat, and this is why. So his name is Mizuchi, um, and he was actually found in the middle of the city by accident. Um, this particular house in a very busy um, part of Colombo, Colombo 5, for any of you all who want to Google it. Um, the landlord had built this outdoor pond and filled this pond with goldfish. And these goldfish at the time were about $2 or maybe $3. Goldfish started going missing. Nobody cared. It was $3, not that much. Then he graduated to Japanese koi. I don't know how many fish connoisseurs are here, but Japanese koi can go to about $100 of fish. These fish started going missing, and of course, alarm bells rang in his head, so he set up security cameras to catch the culprit. <laughs> this is the culprit. Um, <laughs> he's a gorgeous one-and-a-half-year-old cat. Um, we had three months of footage of him catching fish. Um, we have some footage of him just sitting in the pond like a child in a kiddie pool and just turning around in circles because he's trying to catch these fish. Um, and he's not the only one. There was another one that walked out of um, view when he comes down the wall. <laughs> he's very patient. He's a lovely boy. So that's $100 right there. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, 
this particular night, I believe he took five fish. That's 500 bucks. Um, luckily for us, the landlord loved cats. So that worked in our favor. Um, so we collared Mizuchi, and um, this is his home range, or rather, this is where he was found. This is his area. He was found up there. Um, and as you can see, there's no wetland anywhere. His movement pattern looked like this. Up here is an abandoned house. That was his kind of hub. Um, it was very stinky. Fishing cats smell really bad. Um, but I like it because that's the only way I know that the cats are around. So I, I actively go sniffing like a sniffer dog and people think I'm mad when they're walking be, uh, around me. Um, this right here is actually a cinema which um, Mizuchi visited during the um, opening of the Monkey Kingdom. Unfortunately, I couldn't ask him what he thought about it um, because I didn't bump into him after that. Um, so yeah, so now we've got our science in order, so we wanted to start the conservation side of the project and that meant um, awareness. So we started a, a website for the project, so it explains what we do and the species. Um, we also sell t-shirts on and off, so many of you have bought our t-shirts, so thank you. This is actually Neville Buck um, from the Port Lymph Wild Animal Park in London, and that's Nariani, the cat, one of the cats under his care. Um, we have multiple awareness programs for kids, um, and many of them try and steal my, um, my animals. Um, so I have to run behind them when they're getting into their cars with their parents to try and retrieve them. We also have awareness programs for university students, and we try our very best to take all these groups into the wetland so that they are fully immersed in what we're trying to teach them rather than have them in a classroom. So we take them out, we show them how to track, we show them what we do with our camera traps, what we do with our um, trap cages, we show them my wonderful jars of poop, so that they, they can be fully immersed in it. Um, <laughs> so apart from um, our awareness, we also rescue kittens. So we've actually got the public calling us, and the wildlife department, of course, um, when they've got um, kittens. This little girl was about half the size of this guy over here. She was 90 grams, and she was found in this location. So again, no wetland, it's very urbanized um, neighborhood type area. Apart from the fishing cats, we do get, does anyone know what this is? It's, it's, yes, it's Pooh Bear, but what's on Pooh Bear? <laughs> so that's actually a rusty spotted cat. It's the smallest species in the world. Um, so when I got this little girl, she was 70 grams, and she was the size of this guy's head. So I could fit her in my palm. Um, she was a gorgeous little girl. Um, so then we also do wetland conservation because I mentioned earlier wetlands are poorly understood um, habitats. So we work very closely with the government, in particular the Sri Lanka Land Reclamation and Development Corporation, and that's a mouthful, so I will start calling it the SLRDC from now on. Um, and the SLRDC along with the Urban Development Authority, the World Bank and several um, foreign consultants have created the wetland management strategy in Sri Lanka. So they are trying to sustainably use and manage these wetlands now because everyone's realizing how important these habitats are. Um, so with this wetland management strategy, they've started to rehabilitate um, and rebuild wetlands that were previously devastated or cleared. Um, they have also created two wetland parks from scratch to let the public walk in. So it's kind of like the Everglades um, uh, layout. So there are lots of uh, overhead uh, bridges for people to walk over. We've got um, these walkways. We've also got, uh, we allow people to use the boats and go for boat rides and, you know, get, be fully immersed in these wetlands and start to appreciate them. We also have several notice boards around the wetlands uh, displaying the wetland wildlife, in particular the fishing cat. All these boards are in all the, the three languages in Sri Lanka, that's Sinhala, Tamil, and English. 
Um, and also, I'm very proud to say that um, Colombo has actually applied to the Ramsar Convention to for wetland city accreditation. So if we get it, that means we will be one of the few countries in the world known as a Ramsar city. Um, so that means we will be promoting wetland conservation, we will be promoting the, um, the beauty of these habitats, and um, also just the importance of them. And of course, I have to mention, this is my field assistant, he's an amazing man. He was a trishaw driver by trade, and he helped me um, he helped me set up camera traps one day because he saw me lugging 10 camera traps, and I was weighed down, and he jumped out and helped me. And he's been stuck with me ever since. Um, he had, I'm a very clumsy person by nature, so he has helped me not die in the field several times and drown and fall off boats and cut myself. So I owe this man a lot. And um, I'm also proud to say that his four-year-old daughter, who's petrified of wildlife, now accompanies her father to set camera traps. She's also teaching her preschool friends and teachers and family what fishing cats are and why they're important because she's very proud of her father and the work he's doing. So thank you very much for listening to my talk, and I will hand it back over to Jim. These are some of the other cats we're working with. Um, these particular two, bay cat and flat-headed cat, need much more work. They're in Southeast Asia. You all know what's happening in Southeast Asia. And currently, these two are IUCN Red List Endangered. No one is doing anything on them. Here are some pictures from around the world of me working with colleagues and friends, uh, having lunch in uh, Cambodia, truck issues in China. Here's our issues in Bolivia, that people uh, kill the cats and decorate them. And in Guyana, I also had truck problems. Thank you very much. Do Anya and I have a time for uh, questions? Two questions? Yes, yes, Pat. Main problem. Sorry. What's the main problem with the fishing cat that makes it endangered, and is there anything we can do about it? Well, the, the threats vary according to the country that we're in. So in Sri Lanka, we have a problem with roadkill, uh, road strikes, and uh, loss of habitat. Uh, in Cambodia, they're hanging on by a thread. Uh, Vietnam, we believe they're extinct, or at, or at best, just a few remaining, because there's no laws in, uh, in, in Vietnam that protect uh, wetlands. The only good wetland is a, is a rice field. Uh, so the threats vary from country to country. I, I, of course, our goal is to have more people working in each of the countries. But some of the countries, we don't have anyone working. Does anyone have another question? And of course, we'll be here to answer. Yes, please. Uh, what is the incidence of interbreeding between the urban uh, fishing cat and domestic cats? So far, we haven't documented any interbreeding of domestic cats and fishing cats. In fact, a, a fishing cat would probably uh, eat a domestic cat. <laughs> they, they, uh, they are known to prey on uh, palm civets that inhabit people's attics. Uh, so uh, they, the, the domestic cat is so much smaller, it, it, would, it would just be another prey item. Okay, we'll be happy to answer other questions um, that you may have later. Thank you. I'd like to introduce my three colleagues, Rocio, Cynthia, and Rodrigo. To appreciate what they're doing, you have to appreciate the Andean cat. And they're going to tell you a lot more than I'm going to tell you. This is the rarest cat in the Americas. It's also the only cat that's endangered in the Americas. And it's by far the most elusive of all the cats we have in the New World. Many people that work on the project have never seen an Andean cat in person. So it takes an extraordinary person 
to want to help these cats, knowing that you may never see one. Rocio, Cynthia, and Rodrigo are leading the charge to save the Indian cat. And it's a terrific thing to see. And no one in this room is more thankful than me that these three people are dedicating their lives to saving America's most endangered cat. Please welcome my colleagues. I don't need it. Okay. Let me take it down. Thank you, Jim. Hello, everybody. Thank you for being here. I know it's late, but I know you don't want to pay for parking, so it's good <laughs> that they keep you here in that way. It's very smart. I really appreciate what WCN does. Thank you. That was very smart. So as uh, Jim says, we have the pleasure and the disgrace of working with the most endangered cat in the Americas, the Andean cats. Probably, I know there are a lot of friends in this room, and you already know, but for those of you who are new, I start my presentations with a confession. I have been, and I will always be, a crazy cat lady. But that's a thing that I have. Not everybody in my organization is as crazy as I am, which is a good thing because we balance each other. And I've always been loving house cats. Since the first cat I had, I started rescuing kittens when I was a child, and I still do it now. I live with cats and kids and dogs and yeah, other animals too, but I'm not gonna get into that. And cats have been my passion all of my life. But I'm a lucky critical lady, because I'm also a biologist, and I get to talk about cats all day long. So, and I get to work with the most beautiful cat in the planet, that is the Andean cat. This cat species, as Jim said, is the most endangered cat in the Americas, is very elusive, rare, and even when these words mean like, they sound like technical, what they mean is that this species because of the time they are, they, are, they are active, they're usually active at night, and because of the coloring, that they are very similar to the landscape, and because of the rarity, that means there are very few of them, they are really, really hard to find. In the Ending Cat Alliance, we have been working together for 18 years now, and most of us have never seen a cat in the wild. But that doesn't mean we don't know how to find them, and that's the key. So, our last and only estimates of population densities of the Andean cats is that number, 1,378 1, adult cats exist in the wild today. I want you please to think about this number. This is less than, is less than tigers, less than cheetahs, less than elephants. It's even less than pandas for you to get an idea. And this is in the whole range of the species. You know what? It is probably less than the people that came to this venue today. This is a very low number of cats. And if you put that in perspective of from in the place they live, and then cats live in the Andes, and they expand a little bit into Patagonia and southern Chile, from Peru, Bolivia, through Chile and Argentina. This is a surface of 9,551, no, 951,000 square miles, which is kind of like the size of uh, Alaska, your biggest state. When I, when I looked this picture, I thought, well, maybe it's a good comparison, but I don't, it doesn't really tell me anything. But if we put it like this, you can imagine how big that piece of land is. This is the surface that covers all the range of the Andean cat in the world. There are no Andean cats any other way. In not, they are not in captivity in any zoo. They have not been raised anywhere. So this is all the kind of, the, and now try to imagine how many states do we have uh, down there? Like eight states? How many people will live there? 10 million people, something like that? Imagine there are only 1,378 Andean cats in that surface. So that is like taking 
looking for a needle in a haystack to a whole new level, you know. So, in the Anekar Alliance, as I told you, we have been working together for a long time. It's hard. It's complicated. But we do know what needs to be done. And with a lot of effort we have in our teams, we have educators, we have researchers, we have veterinarians. And with tons of field effort, we actually are finding a lot of information of the cats. We know what they eat, where they are, and what are the main threats for the conservation. So that's a female cat. Rodrigo's going to tell you about her later on. And the Amden Cat Alliance, it's a very powerful group. Not only because we um, have a whole team of people working with us, but also because we have very, very strong human power. Today I'm very lucky because I have two of my colleagues with me. And I'm going to leave you now with Cynthia, who's actually, she's probably one of the persons in the Amden Cat Alliance with most, more field experience in the whole group of experts that we are. She has been living in the Andes for several, several years, and she's going to be telling you about her research there. Hi, everybody. <laughs> well, I'm Cynthia. This is my first time at the expo, so I'm kind of, kind of nervous and excited. Uh, I'm here to tell you a little bit about my story with the Andean cat. First of all, I want to tell you that I didn't met I didn't know the Andean cat until I, wa until I was at the university, which is kind of embarrassing. <laughs> uh, I met Juani, my partner, who introduced me to this magnificent species. And since 2007, when I started as a volunteer, I keep working with the Andean cat. To be more precise, I start in October of 2007. So I'm celebrating my 10 years anniversary working with the Andean cat with you. So. If there is something like Rocio told you that I did a lot during my time working with the Andean cat is go to the field. <laughs> during my PhD, I spent from seven to eight months on the field, <laughs> um, living in tents, uh, living in tents without cell phone, without internet, without electricity. And even if my parents believed that I was completely crazy, <laughs> I, I think that did, that allowed me to feel the wildness of the high Andes and to feel a part of this magnificent environment. During the beginning of my work, I keep working with camera traps. We learn a lot from the cameras, but we realize that we need something else. We need to new, a new kind of information. So we decided to start radio collar Andean cat. So that was a big challenge for us. We plan everything on, at the office, and then we go to the field. During our first, um, during our first tramping campaign, we leave, this is our base camp. Uh, I invite you to come with me to the field, and we are going to live there. The square room is our storage room, and the round room is our kitchen, and you can see our tents. This is our kitchen, kitchen while all the team is cooking. So in the bottom of the picture, you can see the one with white and, uh, white and black hair. He's, he's Monty, my dog, <laughs> and he was uh, one of the best field assistants that we have in the team. <laughs> he goes everywhere with us. We live in the camp, we, which is in a valley, and we are surrounded by traps. So every day we woke up and need to go up to the mountains to check the trap, to check the alarms that, they have, that, that the traps have, uh, or to set up traps. So as you imagine, it's not easy to go up in the mountain, in the high Andes, because of the altitude, because of the, the wind, because of the hard sun. But the Andes have something, and they always reward, reward you with a very good landscape when you reach the top of the mountain. During our first trapping campaign, we didn't catch any Andean cat. We just captured this beautiful pampas cat, which is sedated in the picture. But we didn't we didn't give up, so we keep trying. We learn from our mistakes and try again next year. So during the first day of our second trapping campaign, we went 
working hard to get an Andean cat. We set up all the traps during all day. And then we came back to the field, to the kitchen that I showed you, to prepare our dinner. So well, while we were preparing our dinner, an alarm sound. So we pick up all our capture staffs and start to go up in the mountain. As you imagine, it's like a very strange feeling because we want to run up to the mountain to see what was on the trap because we didn't know. But obviously, we can't run in the high Andes. <laughs> so we try we do our best effort, and we reach the trap. When we reach the trap area, I approach very slowly to not disturb the animal. Uh, but the trap was behind the bush, so I couldn't see exactly what it was. And suddenly, I saw a very big, long tail moving up and down behind the bush. So that was one of the most, the most beautiful moments of my life when I realized that we have our first onion cat in a trap. So as you can see, she's Shareta in the trap. <laughs> she's not very happy. <laughs> and through these radio collars, we actually radio collared five onion cats during four years. Uh, we learn a lot. We learn a lot about their biology. We learn a lot about their ecology. But which is most important, we realize that they're really living in conflict with the local communities. Because from the five cats that we have with collars, we found two of them of dead. So Rodrigo is going to tell you more about the conflicts with local communities. But w I think we are very lucky to have uh, people like you that trust in us and to have them to keep us working for the conservation of this amazing species. Now, as I tell you, I'm going to leave you with Rodrigo, who is the coordinator of the mitigation conflict program. Uh, she's from he is from Chile, sorry. Um, he is now doing his PhD in the Minnesota University. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for being here. So I'm about to tell you about the most uh, interesting, most beautiful cat uh, in the Americas, the most endangered wild cat in the Americas, the Andean cat. Ah, uh, but no, th this is a mountain lion. So, but what is the relation of the with this picture? So the Andean cat is facing hu uh, a big conflict related with the human uh, mon mountain lion conflict because. Mountain lions are killing livestock. And what happened with that? All the people get together and go to Andean cat habitat, that is the same mountain lion habitat, and kill every, every species in the mountain like this. So this poor cougar, you know, what is the lucky of this cougar? It's the same for the Andean cat. Hmm? So people use hunting dogs and just kill everything. So it's like a collateral damage hmm, in this conflict. What we are doing like a, as a Andean Cat Alliance, we are working with the local communities. We believe that, the, we strongly believe that is the solution for this problem is just working very close to with local people, identifying local leaders. So uh, this is not a pig, it's a puppy, <laughs> <laughs> but it's an overfeeding, you know. So it's a crossbreeding between between a crossbreed between Great Pyrenees and local dogs. And, uh, this woman is a Do Doña uh, Doña Juana, and she's very interesting uh, character in the Andes Mountains. So she she was belie we believing that she could die without uh, trespass her knowledge to the new generation about. Uh, local training in order to get new livestock garden dogs, but we reached this area and we saved her. So we 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 are interested in your knowledge. We believe in you, and right now she is very happy. As you can see, it's a very old woman. She is very happy right now as a as a local trainer dog for our mitigation conflict program. This is another incredible man that is also a, a local trainer for our program. And you can see this is the, the way that this livestock garden dog are raising. So this is the result of the all this program. So finally, uh, the dog believes that the the goals are his family, and they take care forever, go with the mountain with the goats, and just take away a, any carnivores, any any threat. 
And this, and this, uh, another, this dog, this is a crossbreed between Great Pyrenees and local, and local breeds. And this dog was fighting with a mountain lion and take away the goat from a mountain lion. And the only, the only thing that he got was a scratch in the nose. So he, right now our results are very, very successful. What another thing has, is doing the Andean Cat Alliance in order to mitigate the conflict is raising awareness. We strongly believe that just working with the communities, we can create a difference. So this is a, a mural that we create with local people with local children in local schools. So we, we are working with local artists too in order to create this type of paintings, mural, and we try to describe all the conflicts. So the mountain lions, people, dogs, and the Indian cat walking in a very fragmented habitat and just surviving for in this type of land. So in addition, we are working with very good artists in order to raise awareness. We strongly be we believe that the art message is different when you, you have a, this type of paintings or illustration. So the conservation message is delivering in a different way. The people get in a different way. The <laughs> we are working very hard in order to get new pictures, new, new vi videos about the Andean cat, but these are very elusive species, very secretive species. So in this case, what happened with the species that are very elusive, difficult to see, as the Andean cat? So the people don't know it. So we cannot protect a species that we don't know. Hmm? So what is doing the Andean cat alliance? We finally found a perfect location in order to get very high quality footage of, the, of these species. After 15 years of working along the Andes mountain, we found this location in order to get the first Andean cat documentary. Hmm? Maybe the next year we can get uh, this, this documentary in order to raise awareness. And you can see the landscapes are amazing, at the top of the mountains. This is one of the first uh, Andean cat pictures in the snow, like a, a small snow leopard. Hmm? And this is the more or less a, a sample of the, our work. Habituation about the cameras. He's Moye, the male. A sniffing the lures to attract them. She's the Aguita. Looking for praise, the biscacha, the main prey for the Andes, got a big rodent from the Andes. And the thing that they need to do in order to get the, the habitat, marking their territory. As you can see, it's a domestic cat almost, but it's wild, very secretive, very elusive. And the last video, we get a poo action, you know. The first video about and then cat pooping. <laughs> so thanks for your donation. We, the, la the last year we got the, uh, a new, the first track for the Andean Cat Alliance. So this is a result for all your donations. So thank you so much. I will leave you with Rocio for the next of the presentation. Thank you. You see, I'm not, I'm not only happy because I get to work with the most beautiful cat, I get to work with the most incredible people. Let's give him another applause, come on. So it's a good thing that I had the chance to bring more guests to the, to the expo because Cynthia here, she does not only work, she, did, she on, did not, didn't only do all that incredible work with Andean Cat and Pampas Cat, she is right now the coordinator of her program with, you know, you know what that is, don't you? A chinchilla, yeah, everybody knows about chinchillas. Why do we know about chinchillas? Because they are pets. You know the sad part of it? 
chinchillas are almost extinct on the wild. And that happened because on the fur craziness in the 50s and 60s, where everybody was having their fur coats, these animals were heavily hunted in the Andes. And they are almost gone. There are only three, three recorded populations of this rodent in the Andes, in the whole range. That's almost nothing. So she's going she's gonna to be leading our project that we still need to get funded. So if somebody wants to sponsor it, you're more than welcome to try to find some other colonies in the, in the Argentinian side of the Andes to see if we can start some conservation restoracy techniques with this uh, very unique rodent species. That's not the only thing she will be doing because she's a woman, so she's multitasking. She will be our Argentinian liaison for the cat craft program. In, with this program, you know, I forgot to say in the first part, the main threats for Andean cat conservation are habitat loss and habitat degradation. They are one whole big thing related, and hunting. Rodrigo already, already told you about hunting and what we are doing about it a program that is working really well thanks to you, to our sponsors. And we are trying to face our other threat, which is probably the most challenging, because that habitat loss occurs for different reasons. One, and the most difficult to face is mega mining companies. And a little bit, a little bit more easier is uh, how local communities are losing their own traditions and move into more uh, less habitat friendly techniques. And they are also leaving the, the land and selling it to mega mining companies. So one of the things that we are trying to work really heavily with right now in the next couple of years is in working with these communities and empowering them so they can stay in their land. The Cat Crafts program, it's a program that we are starting to work in three different communities in, uh, around the triple frontier between Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina. We are working with the um, women handicrafts cooperatives to help them design, construct their own favorite handcrafts, and we're gonna provide some help in the design to make it better for the external market and the sale channels. So in this way, we expect for more people to stay in their land and we will revalidate their traditions. Uh, the, which, uh, of course, in exchange, we will have our affiliates in the field and we ask the communities not to hunt Andean cats or other carnivores. This is in their initial stages, but it's been very promising. They actually, the community that we talk with already, they are not naive, completely naive. So they ask the proper questions, you know, they ask us about deadlines and what happens if they don't, if they don't reach a deadline or those kind of things. So it's, this is a very promising approach. We are learning from other organizations, you know, Snow Leopard has, has this kind of approach going on for a long time and they gave us a lot of feedback of how to do it right. And one very interesting thing, you know, the Andes are quite unique, even when in countries like mine, mega mining companies are everywhere. In Bolivia, Peru, and Northern Chile, a lot of communities explode their own gold or silver. And these communities usually do it in a traditional way that is highly pollutant and dangerous for the people. So if we help these communities to be better, they're not gonna be forced to sell their land to the mega mining companies. Because if we, if we approach them and tell them, you know what guys, you are doing it wrong, just close the mine, they're gonna sell the land because it's gonna be worthless for them. So I don't know if anybody here is uh, familiar with the concept of fair mind. This came after what happened with the black diamonds, remember? That it was a craziness of diamonds and child labor and all that stuff. This fair mind concept is a very interesting tool for conservation in these kind of places. What they do is they, they set these high level standards for communities to be able to harvest their own gold or silver following these very elevated quality standards. 
if they obtain all of these, if they achieve all those goals, they get the international certificate of Fairmind, which increases their gain around 50%. It's a lot of money for the communities. So we already, we already put together this proposal. We, ta we are talking with people in Fairmind. We build it together. We identify the community where we have been working with for ambient cloud conservation for a long time. And everybody's into it. And we, it's our next goal for next year is to get enough funds to get this program working. We think this is the biggest hope to stop mega mining companies to get into uh, these other countries. You know, mega mining companies are not the problem themselves. It's the lack of politics in our countries, of, of legal regulations to make them do their work right. So, in you know, the first talk I gave at the WCN Expo, it was in 2005. When I was putting together my talk back then, I didn't re really have a lot to say. We didn't know anything about Andean cats back then. We were working with a ghost. Thanks to our work, and I'm proud to say so, right now we lo know a lot about Andean cat. And what is more important, we know what needs to be done to help them exist, to help them thrive. But the numbers are so low that we are racing against time. One Andean ha cat that is hunted damages the population incredibly. Remember the number, 1,378 cats. So that's what we are against. We are against time and we are against that number. So we need to increase that number. And for that, you know, every amount of money that you can help us with actually will go a long way in South America. If you have any questions, I'm gonna answer questions now. I think we have some time, like a minute. If you have more questions, please approach us in our table. As you know, I like to talk. I like to talk about cats and I like answering questions. So I would be really happy to answer every quest any questions you have, but please, I invite you to help us preserve this cat. Sometimes I get this feeling that I tr I'm trying to hold water with my bare hands. I feel the cats dripping between my fingers and I feel helpless, but I know that together we can make it happen. Thank you very much. We've got time for a couple of questions. I see two popped up right here. Um, hi, I wanted to find out, um, do the Andean cats live in any kind of community networks? Because I know it's a, such a huge, vast territory. Um, do they have like communities? Um, is, the cat, is the Andean cat living communities? Any kind of loose community or? Well, that's a very good question. I think I'm not, we don't have the most precise ecological information to answer that, but we, we know, and Cynthia can tell you a little bit more about it, that the boundaries of the ranges don't overlap, they overlap a little bit. They're not that strict as other cat species. They don't live in communities. Ca and then cats are, long, you know, like most cats, except lions and maybe house cats, they are, uh, Solitary animals, thank you. Even if they are solitary animals, with our radio collars, we found out that they, they overlap a lot. They overlap between individuals inside the same species, and they also overlap a lot with the pampas cat, with, which is the other species that which they uh, share the habitat with. So yes, they, they, don't, they are solitary, but they share their habitat, and they overlap a lot. What is the main reason they're being killed? Rodrigo. <laughs> uh, as I told you, it's a collateral damage. So the farmers don't want to kill the Andean cat, but sometimes confuse and identify like a mountain lion cat. And also they don't have control uh, with their hunting dogs. So hunting dogs just are everywhere in the mountain and just kill every species. So this is the thing. It's like, like a collateral damage related with human mountain lion conflict. I saw the question there. 
That was really great. Um, so is there any hope in the sense that the area is so vast and inaccessible to people and, I mean, there's no real, you know, it's a huge area. Is there any hope in that there's a lot more cats than, than is thought? I mean. Oh, I, lo I love that question. Is it, you know, the, Ande the Andes range, the Andes has been labeled as one of Earth's last wild places. So there is a lot of land without heavily being impacted by humans which is really good for conservation. The number that we provide you in this presentation is an estimate that, you know, it was not easy to reach that number. We didn't get that number by um, making an estimate in a single location. It's a combination of three different researches in three different countries, in three different landscapes that actually provided single population estimates. And then we combine that with uh, information that came from uh, the research done by another member of the Andean Cat Alliance. She was doing her PhD and she, she uh, made a climatological analysis of the landscape and she found the most, uh, uh, the better habitat. And we extrapolate that. It was very complex, way over my, you know, my biologist and I'm not very scientific myself. So, and that estimate is the best estimate we have right now. That's adult, of course. If you count the caps, it's gonna be around, around the double. Of course it can change. You know, the populations in Patagonia probably are a lot bigger, and I don't think they were uh, included into that first estimate. But the populations in Patagonia also are, appears to be separated than the other ones. Now we are doing, we are completing the genetic map of the Andacat uh, uh, across the range. So it, they appear to be, dif uh, di maybe they will be a different subspecies, but they are fragmented. So it's, it's, we don't know if it's how it's gonna change. Okay, let's have one more round of applause for Aga. Thank you. And Jim and Anya as well.